In Einstein's time, Isaac Newton was God. Newton was the founder of modern science. This is the actual first edition of Newton's Principia Mathematica of 1687. This priceless artifact is the very, very famous book which became the foundation of universal physics for centuries until Einstein upset the apple cart. It has been almost 250 years since the apple fell from the legendary tree on Isaac Newton's estate, giving Newton the inspiration to formulate his law of gravity. Newton said that if an object falls, it's because there's a mysterious force called gravity pulling it down. But you know, Isaac Newton himself was not satisfied by that. Objects move because they're pushed. Not pulled, objects move because they're pushed. So what is pushing this? Newton didn't know. So Newton simply threw his hands up and said, I don't know. So I'm gonna invent something called gravitational pull. And Einstein said, no, this theory can't be right. He was prepared to simply go, I really want to solve this problem. I want to really understand the whole universe. Max Planck said to him, you can work on gravity if you want to, but there are two problems. You're not gonna be successful. The problem is too hard. And if you do, no one will believe you. It's an extremely difficult task. It's not clear where to begin or how to go about doing it at all. Ultimately, the thing that gives him that clue turns out to be his old faithful way of reasoning, the thought experiment. So it's what you and I would call daydreaming, but he gets to call them thought experiments because he's Einstein. He's in his office at the patent office, looking out at the window, and he imagined a man working on a roof. And he begins to wonder what would happen if one of those men were to fall off the roof. And then he had the happiest thought of his life, the inspiration of the ages. He had a vision. The man will not actually be feeling his own weight. He would be weightless. And then he imagined if you're in an elevator and somebody cuts the cord, what happens to you? You fall. But the elevator falls at the same rate you do, so you are weightless inside the elevator. So then Einstein got it. It's as though gravity's been switched off. What's really going on? There is no such thing as gravitational pull. The Earth has curved the space around me, and space is pushing me into this chair. Space itself can be curved. That's crazy sounding. <laughs> Space is adjustable. It's actually malleable. Space and time are malleable. It's this flexible thing that can be twisted. You bring an object into space, and it distorts the space around it. Why does the Earth go around the sun? Most people would say, well, the sun's gravity is yanking the Earth toward the sun in a circle. Wrong. The Earth is going around the sun because the sun has warped the space around the Earth, and space is pushing, pushing the Earth toward the sun. He had a new theory of gravity, a new theory of the universe. Einstein publishes his ideas about gravity. At the same time, his work on the atom brings him increased attention. As a result, in 1911, he's offered a position as a full-time scientist at the University of Zurich. The 32-year-old patent clerk finally leaves Bern to become, for the first time, Professor Albert Einstein. People start realizing that those miracle year papers of 1905 are probably right. And he starts getting invited to the Solvay conferences, which are the gatherings of the greatest physicists in Europe. Convened by the Belgian philanthropist Ernest Solvay, these conferences bring together the greatest scientific minds in Europe, and Albert Einstein is among them. In fact, he's the youngest professor there. He made an impression. He was friendly, he was funny. 
And he was smart, really smart, and people saw that. That was also a moment when Mileva must have perceived that she was part, still part of this small Bern world, whereas Einstein had become part of a bigger world. She writes these plaintive letters saying, tell me about it. I wish I were there. I would love to meet these great scientists. It was always my dream to meet these great scientists. She became jealous of not only the other physicists, but of physics itself. Einstein's lectures become the talk of scientific Europe. And he's invited to speak in Berlin, capital of the country in which he was born. Berlin at the time was the most vibrant city in Central Europe. Einstein hadn't been in Germany since he left at age 15 to avoid the draft. He renounced his German citizenship the next year. While Einstein was in Berlin, mainly to visit colleagues, he was also invited by a cousin. A first cousin named Elsa Einstein. They had known each other as kids, but Einstein had uh, lost track of her. Living on her own, had divorced, she had two daughters. She's just the opposite of Maleva. She's not a scientist, she's not an intellectual, but she loves making big old dinners and taking care of Einstein. They liked each other's company, taking long walks, looking at the boats, and he must have been fascinated by her. Einstein returns to Zurich. They exchange fiery love letters. And at one point, it becomes so strong that Einstein says, please don't write me anymore. This isn't going to work. He must have felt that this was an overcomplex situation, even for an Albert Einstein. <laughs> if the mysteries of the heart elude Einstein, the mysteries of the universe trouble him even more. The curvature of space and the warping of space-time, and you just, you scratch your head he has now been struggling for four years to more fully develop his general theory of relativity. His theory of relativity is so complicated that very few people can understand it. Somebody's got to test it. It's not a testable hypothesis. It's not science. It's science fiction. Einstein knows he's on the right track towards solving his theory. Now he must find a way to prove it. It's 1911. For four frustrating years, Einstein has struggled to perfect his general theory of relativity. His theory won't be accepted until he can demonstrate this radical concept. Suddenly, he is struck by an idea. If he can shine a beam of light through an area where space is curved, then according to his theory, the beam of light will actually appear to bend. Light only knows straight lines. What's bent is space. What could have enough gravity to bend light so much? Well, what about the sun? 300,000 times more massive than the Earth, the sun is the perfect object for Einstein's experiment. But how can anyone shine a beam of light around the sun? He says light from a distant star as it passes right next to the sun in the sun's gravitational field will be bent. Because space is bent uh, around the sun. But even if Einstein is right, he'll never be able to see it happen because the sun is just too bright. Except... When is the sun covered so that we can see what's around it without being blinded by the light? That only occurs during a total solar eclipse. Here's the sun, and it's blocked by the moon, and suddenly all the stars come out. He figured if you have the sun here, and there's stars way back here, and the light's coming in toward you, it will bend slightly. So to your eye, you think that the stars had gone out like that. Light going around the sun. That's something that even his mother could understand. Nobody actually was willing to say, without doubt, this is the truth, until somebody can prove it by taking a picture. So who do you turn to? You turn to the astronomers, the astrophysicists. Our laboratory is the entire universe. By 1912, Einstein believes he is finally on the verge of proving his long percolating and provocative theory. He publishes this 
revolutionary prediction and puts the call out to the astronomy world. Go out and measure, he said. Go to an eclipse and do this observation. Nothing happened. He actually wrote to well-known astronomers trying to interest them in doing a test and was a little discouraged, I think, because he discovered, as people often do, that astronomers are busy people with many things to do and don't necessarily drop everything at the drop of a hat, even for Einstein. It's a frustrating and bitter setback for Einstein. But then, at the Berlin Observatory, a young assistant answers the call. He's an impassioned and brazen young man who's willing to go, quite literally, to the ends of the Earth for Einstein. His name is Erwin Finley Freundlich. Freundlich was in his early 20s. He wanted to make a name for himself. He got a sense that here is my chance. This is new stuff. It's important stuff and I could be part of it. I've seen the letter that goes the, in the other direction from Einstein to Freundlich, and it's all filled with this excitement. You astronomers can do great help to me by finding proof of the relativity theory. And that's Einstein, the human being, who is trying to get somebody to do things for him because he needs him. He finds out from Freundlich that he's getting married to his girlfriend, Katja. And they're going to honeymoon in the Alps. So Einstein says, come to Zurich and let's meet. Freundlich is on his honeymoon with his bride and he goes to meet Einstein. He's looking for, for him out the window and there he is, there's Einstein. He can recognize him because he's wearing this straw hat and he's standing out like a sore thumb. And this is the famous Einstein that he's corresponding with, with this prediction and this great opportunity. And he's going to get to meet him. So he gets off the train and he shakes his hand and they're all animated. And before they can talk, they whisk the couple off the train and they go to Frauenfeld nearby. It's a suburb. To their surprise, the newlyweds are spending their honeymoon in an auditorium listening to Einstein speak. And in the middle of the lecture, Einstein says, we need this eclipse test, and the man who's going to decide is sitting in the audience. His name's Erwin Freundlich, and there he is, and everyone looks, and Freundlich has to stand up and be recognized. And so Freundlich was thrilled, you know, this recognition at this great meeting. On the way back to Zurich, Einstein engages Freundlich in an intense discussion about gravitation while the new fiancé, Katya, just looks at the scenery. They start hatching up that plan of going to a total solar eclipse. The problem with the total solar eclipse, of course, is that it's only visible over a small area of the Earth because the shadow of the moon is actually only a few miles wide. They get these tables and they realize that the next total solar eclipse will occur in the Crimea, which is in Russian territory, on the 21st of August, 1914. Freundlich goes to his boss, says, look, let's go to Russia. I'm collaborating with Einstein. Will you put the money up? And he says, no way. He just refuses. Einstein is absolutely furious. Reaching beyond the European scientific establishment, Freundlich writes to the director of the Lick Observatory near San Jose, California, a rugged outpost of American astronomy. It was a community living on the mountain. They all had their families, their wives were there, their kids were there. They were depending on each other for survival. For many years, it had the largest refracting telescope in the world. But most importantly, it has William Wallace Campbell, a pioneer of eclipse photography. In the 19th century, eclipses used to be attended by astronomers who just did visual observations. I saw this, I saw that, they would draw diagrams, and if people disagreed, it was one guy's word over another. Photography meant you can actually capture what was happening and do precise measurements. Campbell pioneered that technique in 